All right. Before I start preaching, I just have to make the comment, I don't care how large the building is, the front row is usually vacant. <laughs> I just have to point out the obvious. So there's nothing wrong with these seats. They're actually very comfortable. Just saying. Thank you, Brother Luke. You're a good man, Brother Luke. <laughs> All right, Hebrews chapter 11. This is a a very encouraging passage. Hebrews chapter 11 is something we can always look at and look back at our Christian lineage, if you will. We can look back at some people that have overcome great circumstances and they did it all through faith in the Lord. Let's start here in verse number 6. Hebrews 11, verse number 6, the Bible reads, But without faith it is impossible to please Him, for He that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Right. So if you don't have faith in God, it's impossible to please God. There is no such thing as good works for the unsaved. The Bible calls those dead works in Hebrews chapter 6. Right. So here he's saying, if you're going to come to God, first you have to believe that He is God. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, understanding that He's God. But notice this second half. This is often overlooked. But it says, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Sometimes coming to God is something where it's like, well, I know he's going to judge me and he's going to reward me. I want the rewards. Right? Listen, he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Not only do we trust God for salvation, we also trust him for payment of the works that we do while we're here. Now jump ahead to verse number 24. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Stop right here for a second. Now, at this time, Egypt had all the treasures in the world. I mean, if there was a treasure, Egypt had it. In fact, Egypt was taking treasures from other parts of the world. And and here he's saying that he counted it treasure to be reproached for the name of Christ. Treasure to be known as a person of God. And he says, look at the end of this verse here. He says, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. The title of my sermon tonight is Respect of the Reward. We need to respect the fact that God will reward us. We need to be encouraged by the fact that God will reward us. I've met people that try to say, that. well, you know, I don't really work for rewards. Well, yeah, you do. Don't you go to job to get a paycheck? Yeah. Listen, I mean, you don't just show up to job because you like everybody there. You don't just go to work because your boss is a really nice fella. You go there because you will be rewarded. And God has ingrained this in us. He even says in Ecclesiastes that the gift of God is to enjoy the fruit of your labor while you're here on the earth. How much the more? The rewards that we'll have in heaven. You know, as Christians, we need to remind ourselves and we need to encourage ourselves with the fact that we will have treasure in heaven one day. We need to respect that reward and look forward to that reward and if we have respect for God's law and the fact that we'll be rewarded and judged you know we will actually get more rewards we will judge ourselves instantly and we won't slip into sin we'll look ah you know what I'm caught I almost did something wrong Lord forgive me I want the reward I want to do the right thing I don't want the punishment I don't want the chastisement you know the Lord says we have treasure in heaven he says we have rewards in heaven There is treasure that is trustworthy. The treasure in Egypt is gone. They've robbed it. They've sold it. They've melted it down. They've hid it in basements. There's some still there, but you can't trust in that treasure. What happens if a meteorite hits it? What happens if if lava comes out of the sky and hits Egypt? You can't trust in that treasure. But we have a trustworthy treasure in heaven with the Lord. He will repay us. It says a recompense of the reward. God's going to pay us in eternity for our work today. And you know, we earn this even through our words and through our thoughts. This is very important. It's easy to think, well, you know, I went out soul winning today. 
It's raining. It's cold. It's miserable. Even if you didn't get anybody saved, the Lord's going to reward you. Right. right? You're obeying His commandment. You know, I spent 30 minutes to talking to some guy and he's such a bonehead. He still thinks he has to work his way to heaven. Well, you will, you'll be rewarded for that. But what about your thoughts? That's good. What about the things you allow to go into your mind? Yeah. What about the words you allow to come out of your mouth? Listen, in a discouraging time, the devil wants to get your thoughts captive. And he wants you to draw you away from godly thoughts. And he wants you to be thinking about the bad things and the worst situation. And there's no reward for that. Listen, if you would have respect for the reward of God, you would cast down those imaginations. You would take those thoughts that are causing you to be you know, full of grief and you would say, I don't want these thoughts. I don't care about these thoughts. Let's focus on the victories that God has given us. Let's focus on the Word of God. Amen. In 1 Timothy 5, he says, the laborer is worthy of his reward. God wants us to do things worthy of a reward. He wants us to think things worthy of a reward. And He wants us to say things worthy of a reward. That's what we'll be rewarded for. And the thing is, you know, we're not, we will never get a reward in heaven when we're walking in the flesh. I don't care how great of a work you do, if you're walking in the flesh, there's no reward. There's no treasure for that. It's when you're walking in the Spirit. Now this phrase in the verse here, respect unto the recompense of the reward. This re word recompense is an older word that means a repayment essentially. And don't trust me or the dictionary for that. Let me prove it to you out of the Bible. In Romans 12, he says, Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. This same verse, as quoted in Hebrews 10, it says, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. So when he says there is a respect under the recompense of the reward, he's saying you need to respect the fact that God will repay you when you work for Him. He will reward you for doing the right thing. For thinking the right thing. We need to trust the Lord to repay others when they do the wrong thing. And we need to trust the Lord to repay us when we do the right things. Look at verse number 35. Women received their dead, raised to life again. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. A better resurrection. Did you know that you could have a better resurrection? Today, right now, in the resurrection of the just, you have something to look forward to in particular. You have a set of rewards. You have treasure in heaven. And God says, hey, do you want something better? Do you want something more than what's already waning for you? God wants us to desire and get excited about the rewards that He has looking for us. We have things that we can't even, we can't even comprehend. I use the analogy, you know, explain to your dog how a combustion engine works, right? That's kind of, now, explain to a Christian exactly how the heavenly reward system is. Well, I don't know. I'm in the flesh. That's all spiritual. That's all eternal. I'm temporary right now in this flesh. So I don't get it all. But what I do understand is what God has promised and that God will reward us for things that we've earned. Go to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. In Luke 14 is where Jesus said, we shall be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. God has something for you. God has rewards that will last forever. And there's some, or I, there's probably none. There's some, there's a lot, and there's more. And you know, if it's up to you, wouldn't you want more? Wouldn't you want to have a greater resurrection? Wouldn't you want to be over 10 cities instead of one city? Hey, wouldn't you rather be over 10 cities instead of being over the broom closet? These are rewards that are decided while we're alive. It's based on what you think, what you say, and what you do today. In Matthew chapter 6, he says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. Listen, physical blessings on the earth, that's part of God's recompense system. That's part of God's reward system. If you obey Him, He will bless you on the earth. If you disobey Him, He will correct you on the earth. But listen, there's also this eternal reward, this treasure in heaven we have to look forward to. He says, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. And then he says, and we quoted this earlier today, he says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be 
also. The question is, is your treasure in heaven? Do you want your treasure in heaven? You have a trustworthy treasure in heaven, and today all you have is what's physically on the earth. And listen, this isn't like silver coins. You know, I I collect silver coins because I don't trust the fiat currency and the Federal Reserve is a scam. Hey, more power to you. But guess what? You can't take those silver coins with you. Guess what? If they want to print a bunch of silver certificates and sell them just as good as the, as the, as the money, the, the metal, they can drive the price of the metal down and make your metal worthless if they want. So don't put your confidence just in treasure on the earth or coins on this earth. We have to have confidence in the treasure that's in heaven. You know, we need to be looking for the day of the Lord. We need to be excited and, and, you know, the Bible says that we're willing rather to be with Him, right? Absent from the body, present from the Lord, right? And He's saying, hey, I know you want to go, but it's not yet. It's not needful. There's things you need to do here now while you still can. And listen, in trying times, we need to remind ourselves about all this because, you know, the Lord gives all of these things as an example. Hey, the end times are coming. Hey, they may even be upon us, right? It could be 50 years from now. It could be 10 years from now. It could be two. I don't know. Right? But what we do know is that as a Christian, we're going to go through ups and downs in life. And in the end times, the Lord will reward us for our work that we do today. You're in Revelation chapter 11. Look at verse number 18. Revelation 11, verse number 18. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. And the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Go to Revelation 22. So he's saying there's coming a day when the Lord will judge everyone. Everyone's judgment is, is, is coming. Whether they see it now or not, whether they understand it or not, even the small, even the little kids have a judgment for the things that they do while they're in this flesh. You have an eternal judgment coming and it's based on the things you do in the flesh. In Revelation 22, look at verse number 10. And He saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And he that is unjust... So wait, when He says seal not, He's saying don't make this mysterious. Don't make it unavailable. In fact, publish it print it, proclaim it, let everybody know what was just said in the book of Revelation because the time is at hand. It's relevant now. We need to hear it now. And yet people will hear it and they will still be unjust. Look at the next verse. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He's saying there are people that know the eternal torment and the judgment of God and they're still unjust. They're still filthy. They're still unrighteous and they don't want God. He's warning us about these people. Look, he says, he continues, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, hey, if you're righteous, you're saved, stay righteous. Live righteously because there is a reward coming. For that very fact, you need to keep in mind and respect the recompense of the reward. Respect the fact that you are working for a reward. Don't shy away from that. Don't be ashamed that you're going to be paid for your labor while you're here. Those of you that went soul winning today, you will be paid of God. Ladies, you that stayed with the babies and suffered the weeping and gnashing of teeth so daddy can go soul winning, you will be paid of God. We part alike. We're rewarded alike. God wants us as families, as individuals, to work for Him on this earth. Amen. It's our choice. If you freely choose to obey the Lord, He will freely choose to reward you in eternity with amazing rewards. I can't even begin to describe what they're going to be like. The Bible, again, it it only touches a little bit on heaven. It talks more about the new heaven and the new earth, or or really new Jerusalem and the millennium, than it does what to expect in, in the future. But God still gives us a glimpse into these things, and He constantly reminds us. All throughout Matthew, Jesus used this phrase about reward in heaven. 
You suffer reproach, there's a reward in heaven. You're taking abuse, there's a reward in heaven. You keep you take it patiently, there's a reward in heaven. Sometimes we don't see the reward in the flesh and we get discouraged, we get worried, we wonder. And God, hey, look, God gave us the Bible to teach us about the eternal reward as a means of encouragement. You know, we all joke about it. Well, I know the end of the book. I know what happens at the end. Well, we just read the end. We just read Revelation 22. And he says, Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. We read about the faith chapter. Very famous. The Old Testament. They're all saved just by faith. And what's it say? They had respect unto the reward. They feared God. They did what He said. They knew they would be rewarded. In Isaiah 40, he says, Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand and His arm shall rule for Him. Behold, His reward is with Him and His work before Him. You're in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look, he's, what he's going to teach us here is the only treasure we can trust in is, is the trustworthy, eternal reward that comes from God. Look at verse number 8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. In other words, even though, you know, if you say, well, well I, I'm friends with that guy that went soul winning. Well, you need to go soul winning. Right now, as a family, your family is rewarded together. As, you know, but the message he is trying to say here is, are you looking forward to the reward? He's reminding you, you as an individual have certain requirements, certain position in life. And if you obey the position God has given you, then you will get a great reward. Are you looking forward to that reward? Are you judging yourself now in anticipation of the reward in heaven one day? Are you judging what you think? Are you judging what you say? Are you judging yourself in what you allow? What you do in your house when no one is looking? These things matter. Look at verse number 12. Now if any man will build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. Because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. What do you say? Hey, sometimes we look at people and we say, well, surely they're hard workers for God, but the truth will come out in the end. God's the one that judges that. It's not just by the appearance of man. You know, Jesus said we judge unrighteous judgments. We judge by appearance. God judges the heart. He judges the spirit. Look at verse 14. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Spiritual treasure is only earned while walking in the Spirit. Think about this. This is spiritual treasure in heaven. It's a reward. It's a repayment. It's a recompense of God. You cannot earn that while walking in the flesh. Yeah, but I told them. I showed them. I said, hey, I'm... No, no, no. You're in the flesh. You're wrong. Are you humble? Are you peaceful? Are you loving? Those are the fruits of the Spirit. right? The works of the flesh are manifest. Let's talk about the fruit of the Spirit because that's the only way to be rewarded of God. There are a lot of people through thousands of years that have done things in their own name, in their own power, thinking, surely I'll be rewarded of God. People point back at Charles Spurgeon. He built this great ministry. He had 5,000 people come to his church on Sundays. Well, the guy's gospel was wrong. He did it in his own name, in his own work. He has no reward. He did it in the flesh. Look at verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Again, walking in the flesh is a waste of time. It is not just a little bit waste of time. Well, I have an hour until I have to go to work. So I'm just going to kill that time. No, that hour was something you could have done with eternal value. You could have taken that physical, fleshly hour and converted it into spiritual currency, into spiritual time, and invested in your future. Look at 16. He says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Well, why does it matter what we do? Because you're the temple. The Spirit is in you. You have the Spirit of God in you right now so you can do great works for God on this earth right now. 
Verse 17, he says, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. God destroys people. It's called a sin unto death. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Go to Ephesians chapter number 5. God wants us to understand that our body can be destroyed by Him at any moment. He owns us. He bought us with a price. He can do whatever He wants. And He's given us a choice. And if you choose to invest your time in obeying the Lord and working for the Lord, He will greatly bless you, not just now, but also in the future. There is treasure in heaven waiting for you that I can't even tell you about it. But do you believe the Lord? Do you trust the Lord that He has something great for you? In 2 Corinthians 5, he says, Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. Do you work on this earth to just please your boss? To just please your wife or your spouse? It's His pleasure when we are obedient. His pleasure is our obedience. right? And then His treasure is our soul. And He gives us treasure and reward for obeying Him. He says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. God's going to judge us all one day, one way. And there are things that we have done in this life that are such a waste of time. We will suffer loss. It won't be rewarded at all, whatever. But thank God for those things that we will be rewarded for. You're in Ephesians chapter 5. Look at verse number 9. He says, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. How can we tell if it's the fruit of God's Holy Spirit? Is it good? Is it right? Is it true? Look at verse 10. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Right? He said that we may be accepted of Him. Proving what is acceptable unto Him. That's what our life ought to be. We let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in Heaven. They can look at our Christian walk and say, well, that guy's walking in the Spirit. That's what a Christian ought to look like. What he is doing is acceptable to God. That's the type of Christian he wants us to be to show this proof to the world. Verse 11, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather... Reprove them. Rather, reprove them. Don't just fellowship with the wicked things. Correct them. Call them out. I know a guy, and I've, I've heard him correct video games. They're wicked. Oh, don't play video games. They're full of trash. It's all the devil's stuff. Well, now he's falling out of church, and guess what he's doing with his life? Having fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, sitting around playing video games, wasting his mind, wasting his time, giving up on getting a reward from God. It's wicked. He's trying to give us a contrast here. The fruits of the Spirit versus the the works of darkness, he actually calls them here. What are the works of darkness? Let's take a step back. Go to verse number 3. Ephesians 5, verse number 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. He's saying, don't go back to the vomit like a dog would. Don't go back to your old worldly ways. I don't care what you did before. Now you're without excuse. You have the Holy Spirit. Your your conscience is not seared. These things should not once be named among you. You have the power to overcome them. You have the Spirit. God will provide a way out. It shouldn't once be named. Look at verse 4. He says, Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting. Jesting could be uh, uh, perverted jokes. You know, taking jokes the wrong way. Have you ever worked around somebody that they have something to say about everything and it's always wrong, it's always weird? You need to rebuke that person and tell him to stop. And he will stop. He won't say it around you anymore. He says, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. What's the fruit of the Spirit he's talking about here? In contrast to the darks, giving thanks. Yeah, but you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what they did to me. You don't know what they're saying about me. Why don't you stop and give God some thanks? For what you do have. Do you have family members that are saved? That love you? That you love them? You have a good relationship with? That's worthy of of giving thanks. That's That's worthy of getting on your knees and weeping before the Lord and saying, thank you for what I do have. Thank you for the... uh, I I will glory in them when I see them in heaven. That's giving of thanks. Look at verse 5. He says, For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance 
in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Now look, there's two ways to read, well, there's three ways to read this verse. Let's get the, the, the wrong way out of the way first. Number one, it's not saying, well, if you do this sin, you can't be saved, right? Or if you go back to that sin, you lose your salvation. That's just wrong. When he's saying there's no inheritance, you know, there are, there are, the, the works of the world are manifest. The works of darkness, it looks like this. What does an unsaved person look like? Well, it looks like these works is what he's telling us. But also think about this. There are people that don't get an inheritance. There are people, you know, imagine, uh, you, know, the, you know, two sons working for the same father. One goes to work, the other sits on his butt. Well, the one that went to work gets an inheritance and the other son would not, Right? When they get to heaven, if, if there are Christians that look like and act like these wicked people, they have zero reward in their inheritance. Does that make sense? You see what he's saying there? He says, he says, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Now, I do believe that the primary application is those that are unsaved look like this and they will not have anything. The, un, the unsaved world has zero rewards from God. Period. Period. Well, I gave money to the poor. doesn't matter. I went to church every week. does not matter. It does not matter. Some believers also will have the same type of reward when they get to heaven, which is nothing. They will suffer loss because they did no works for God. Look at verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. He's talking about, look, don't let... Other people say, well, oh, it's okay, you can, sin. you can continue in sin. You should say, God forbid. I can continue in sin, yes, but I will be judged of God. I will not be rewarded of God, therefore, God forbid. Don't be deceived. I will be corrected. I don't want to be corrected. Verse 7, be not ye therefore partakers with them. Hey, or you'll be judged as well. Yep. You'll be judged with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord, walk in as children of light. Again, you have to be walking in the Spirit to obtain a spiritual reward. Jump ahead to verse 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame to even speak of those things which are done of them in secret, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. He's saying when you preach the word and you correct sin and you say stealing money is a sin and the people that help cover that up is a sin, you're shining a light on that darkness. Right. When you say fornication is a sin and people that allow it or that overlook it or through vain words try to tell you it's okay, in fact, why don't you participate? That is a sin. Those are the works of darkness. Shine the light. Make it manifest. Verse 14. Wherefore he saith, Awake, thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Again, walking in the Spirit. Circumspect. That means circle vision. You're looking around. You're in the Spirit. You're aware of your surroundings. You're, you're on guard. You're vigilant. You're not just lollygagging through life until you fall in a pit. You're paying attention to where you're going. Why? Look what he says, 16. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Go to Galatians chapter 5. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Our time is short on this earth. In fact, it's a drop in the bucket when you compare it with eternity. Sure. Your status in eternity, your rewards with God are based on how you invest your time today. God has given this as a reminder to us as a way to encourage yourself in the Lord. As a way to reflect back to what God's purpose is for your life. I've known people that when they, they lose a spouse or when they break up with a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or they get in a car accident, it's like their whole life is devastated. I poured everything into that car. I thought she was the one. Oh, I can't believe that daddy is gone. But you know what? That's not what our life is about. That's not what your purpose is about on this earth. It's to have respect unto the reward. You need to respect the fact that God will reward your labor now. You need to invest your time in people now. 
Invest your time in your own thoughts. Don't let your thoughts be drawn away. Do you have respect unto the recompense of the reward? If you do, you have treasure forever. Look at Galatians chapter 5. We're almost done here. We're going to look at Galatians 5 and I think we'll be done. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He's saying you're saved. You're free spiritually. You've been made free. Don't go back to the bondage of sin. Right? Don't keep going back to serving sin. In John 8, he said, he said, if you continue in My Word, then are you My disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Too many Christians, they get made free, they're set at liberty, and they go back to that yoke. They literally put a bondage, a burden on them of continuing in sin. Well, I just like my old lifestyle. You know what? You can choose to do that. You're still saved, but you're not going to have God's blessing. Not on this life, nor the life to come. Hey, thank God there are people that are saved, you know, and they may never have done any works, but God's promise is true. It is a free gift. They'll still get there. But how much the more, if people would just change their mind and change their heart about the reward of God and understand that they are either under the judgment or under the reward. They're either walking in the flesh or they're walking in the Spirit. Look at verse 13 in this chapter. Galatians 5, verse number 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in, in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You've been called unto liberty? Don't go back to the flesh. How do I remain in liberty? Love. How do I fulfill God's law? Love. Look at verse 15. This is so important. But if... Here's the opposite of love. If ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Yeah, but you don't understand. They're biting and devouring me. i got to get them back. No, don't do it. Don't give in to that trap. If you give in to that trap, you will be consumed. How do you prevent yourself from being consumed? Love those that are biting and devouring you. Well, Brother Fannin, that's not easy. Hey, Christian life's not easy. That's right. Right? Walking in the Spirit is not always easy. Walking in the flesh is the easy, wrong thing to do. Don't go back to walking in the flesh. Don't go back to the bondage of sin. Yeah, but if I can just get them back, if I can gnash on them with my teeth, I can set the record straight, everything will be fine. No, it won't. No, it won't. Vengeance belongs unto the Lord. He's going to repay them. Do you believe that? Do you trust that? Do you know that He's going to pay them? Well, then you ought to know He's going to pay you for loving them that are biting and devouring you. Don't give in to it or you will be consumed also. Look at verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. You know, it's so clear, but in context, these verses, that verse in the middle is often overlooked. Walk in the flesh, you're biting and devouring. Walking in the Spirit, you're loving. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 17. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to another, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. This is like Apostle Paul talking about, my Spirit wants to do this, my flesh wants to do that. The things I don't want to do, well, I'm doing it. The things I say we shouldn't do, I'm doing it. And those things I really want to do in the Spirit, I'm not getting them done. Why? Because they're contrary. The flesh lusteth, fights against the Spirit. The flesh wants to overcome your spirit and vice versa. And if we will allow ourselves to walk in the Spirit of God, we will be rewarded with spiritual blessings, rewards in heaven. That's His promise of judgment. That is righteous judgment. Look at verse 18. He says, But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Not only are you not breaking the law when you're walking in the Spirit, but you're probably getting rewards in heaven. You understand that? If you're walking in the Spirit of God and you're filled with His Holy Spirit, you can't break God's law and you're probably getting treasure in heaven for obeying Him. Look at verse 19. So, we, we, we're going to compare again the Spirit and the flesh. Verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, 
idolatry. So, so all of those kind of fall in the same, if you will, fleshly sins. And then he goes on to uh, idolatry and witchcraft, which you could also lump together. False gods, you know, necromancy. But he says idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, and heresies. All those are kind of lumped together about how we deal one with another. With our brethren. Look, he keeps on in that, in that mind. He says, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So in verse 21 there, he gives you this whole list of fleshly things, and he says that's what an unsaved person looks like. They will not go to heaven. This is what you should expect from the world, but don't act like them. There's, there's no reason for you to go back to those ways or join them in those ways. We shouldn't have fellowship with those dark works. That's the, the works of the flesh. He's contrasting it now to the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit... right? Or you could say, the, the treasure in heaven that comes from the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy... Peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Do you see how opposite those things are? Do you see how it's impossible for you to fleshly really just love your brother when you're talking bad about him, when you're gnashing on him with your teeth, when you're about, you know, biting and devouring? It's hard for us to be gentle one with another when we're walking in the flesh and we're striving and there's, there's problems and there's frustrations. Whenever you find yourself walking down that path, just stop and repent and recognize before God that you're not in the Spirit. That you're not in the Spirit. Yeah, but I'm justified. I'm right. I got the facts. Just stop. Let go of all that. Humble yourself. Have some love. Understand that the power of the Spirit is greater than the power of the flesh. And inside yourself, there is a war in your members, is what Paul said, that one is fighting against the other so that you would not do the things that you want. Look at verse 23. Meekness. Temperance. Against such there is no law. Meekness. How humble and meek are we? How temperate are we with our spirit, with our tongue, with our attitude? When you're temperate and in control of your own spirit, you, you won't break God's law. You're walking in the spirit. Look what he says, verse 24. And they that, have, and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Go to 2 Peter chapter 3 and we'll be done there. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. We are alive through God's Holy Spirit. We have eternal life through God's Holy Spirit. Now we need to walk in that Holy Spirit. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. We've been made alive. We've been quickened by His Holy Spirit. Now walk in that Spirit and use the power that's been given to you. In 2 Peter chapter 3, look at verse number 11. Seeing then that all these things that shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be? There's the question for the week. What manner of persons ought ye to be? If you're writing your own uh, you know, obituary, what manner of person ought you to be? You're writing your own life story right now. You're writing your rewards in heaven. What manner of person ought you to be? What can you fix now? What can you change now? What, where can you uh, tighten up a little in your own life? Where can you straighten up a little? Where can you uh, invest your time a little more wisely to have rewards in heaven? He says, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Why? Verse 12. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. He's saying one day, not only is this earth going to burn, the heavens will burn. Everything will be dissolved and destroyed. I believe even God's God's heaven he, that He created His throne in on day one, I believe that also will be destroyed because He will make new heavens and new earth. Look, He says, verse 13, Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens 
and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. In that new earth and in those new heavens will be nothing but righteousness. It will be the reward of the Lord. We will rule and reign with Him. We have treasure to look forward to and we have to get it right now. You have to respect the reward now. When the Holy Spirit reveals something to you, your choice is to have a respect under the reward or grieve the Holy Spirit. To just recognize that if I obey, it's not going to be easy in the flesh. I might look like an idiot to my friends, but you know what? I'm going to obey God. There's a spiritual reward for obeying Him. Verse 14, last verse. He says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, that ye may be found of Him in peace, without spot, and blameless. In retrospect, looking back on your life when it's done, don't you want to be able to say that I tried to maintain my peace? I tried to be spotless and blameless before the Lord. I had respect for the reward. I had respect that I would be judged. Judged. Are you looking forward to that day? Are you looking forward to the day of the Lord? Are you looking forward to your rewards? Are you judging yourself now for a reward in heaven one day? Listen, this is so important. Judge what you think, right? What comes out of your heart will come through the mouth. It will cause you to do things that starts in the mind, that starts in the heart. We must judge what we think. We can't bite and devour or hold grudges. We have to cast down these imaginations. We can't be overcome with evil. Some situations you just have to commit it to Him that will righteously judge that. Let Him avenge and then you can have peace. And you will not have peace until you overcome that by letting go. Judge your mind. Judge your thoughts. Right? We need to judge our words also. Like I said, you know, make your words sweet in case you have to eat them. Our words should be uplifting each other. You know, so it's easy to get involved with, oh, well, yeah, that person over there, I can't believe they did that. You know, that biting and devouring. Be careful. You also might get consumed of your own words. Be careful what you say. Don't let the devil... Use your tongue to tear somebody down. Even if it's an enemy. Don't let the devil use your tongue to tear anybody down. Our tongue, when it's used by the Holy Spirit, will encourage, it will uplift, it will edify, it will build the church. It will speak life into people. There's power of death and life in the tongue. Are you speaking death? Or are you speaking life? When you recognize you're speaking death, that you're saying something negative, have respect unto the reward. Stop what you're doing. And speak some life and God will bless you for it. Are you judging what you're doing with your time on this world? That's what it all comes down to. You have a limited amount of time. What little bit of time you have in this life will be multiplied in eternity. What manner of persons ought ye to be? It's the question we need to ask. Are you respecting the fact that you will be rewarded of God? Let's pray. Lord God, thank You for these encouraging passages. Hebrews 11, Galatians 5, Ephesians 5. Lord, I pray that You would help us to reflect on these and remember that You've given us these passages to know that You will judge us. To know that You will reward us. Lord, I pray that You would help us to walk in the Spirit understanding that You will reward us with spiritual things if we obey You. Lord, I pray that You would help lift our spirits and encourage us and follow You and You alone, Lord. Lord, I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.